it goes with I think it goes with the, um, the heterosexual relations. It goes with the um, the way that men and women were kept separate. So if the if a girl is going to get married at the age of as soon as she can at the age of fifteen, and the male has to wait until he's at least thirty or even forty to get married, then and he's not allowed to have um, extramarital affairs with um, other men's women. He's not supposed to have, um, of course, he can have affairs with courtesans, and a lot of them did, but that could be very expensive. Um, and so a lot of Greek writers associate Greek homosexuality with all male living, especially uh-huh. in Crete yeah. and Sparta, where there seems to be long, um, formal times when men were actually sleeping together in barracks and eating together every night. So there was a very strong separation of the sexes. Um, but the other aspect of that is this focus on nudity, athletics, the Greek body. So it's not just a matter of um, men finding companionship or establishing relations with men because there were um, no women citizens, at least, who were available for that. There's also a great eroticism. There's also a lot about uh, you know, naked statues, um, it's a physical, lustful thing, and that's that's what um, I think is very hard for us to get our heads around. That it's assumed to be that all men um, will be attracted to handsome young men. That they, you know, the, they use the same word "kalos" to mean good and noble, but also beautiful. That seems to be a social institution, and somehow it sits alongside heterosexuality um, without much. Problem. There's no. There's no problem with people reproducing in ancient Greece. The, the population <laughs> keeps on going up. You know, there doesn't seem to be any. But it, it, so it looks like a gay society in terms of their appreciation of male beauty, their obsession with um, male same-sex love. Um, on the other hand, l- sitting quite happy alongside it is marriage, reproduction, families. Well, you have to, first of all, with Plato, you have to say, um, Plato writes dialogues. Um, and that means two things. First of all, they're often, somebody told me that's about something that somebody else said. So he distances himself from the actual text uh-huh, of the yeah. dialogue. Um, and then he has lots of different characters. Normally, he has lots of different characters. Um, some very vivid characters, like Aristophanes or um, Alcibiades appear in Symposium. Does everything that Aristophanes say, does that reflect Plato's views? Or is Plato acting like a dramatist and making his characters say things which characterize them or which are foolish? So I think that the, um, what's interesting about Plato's Symposium is that, first of all, you, your suspicions are raised because it's very unusual for a source um, telling you what the situation is about their own time um, when everybody, all the contemporary witnesses, ought to know that themselves. You don't go around describing things which everybody agrees on. So already there's a sense of, um, is he trying to play a fast one? Is Is there something going on there? But the other thing which I think is quite interesting is that um, this character, Pausanias, is able to look at different different parts of ancient Greece. He's able to compare Athens with others. So there's this idea that different cities have different modes of same-sex love, of Greek homosexuality. So that's why I I always emphasise there's no such thing as Greek homosexuality. Uh There's Greek homosexualities, and they can talk about them and compare them and contrast them. In Sparta, it's like this. In Crete, it's like this. In Elis, at Olympia, it's like this. In Boeotia, it's different again. And often they can say it's disgusting the way they do things in Boeotia. <laughs> um, poor Boeotians come in for a bad lot. Um, and then, finally, he comes around to Athens. In Athens, he says, the way we do it here is the most beautiful of all. Um, but and my students love this. He also says it's very hard to understand. It's complicated and hard to understand. So when any student writes an essay on the topic, they can always say, 
Even Plato is <laughs> complicated and hard to understand. But anyway, Pausanias tries to make sense of it all, and the way he makes sense of it, uh, and especially the anomaly that um, the, the men who pursue the beautiful boys are encouraged to pursue, but the beautiful boys are encouraged to resist. So that's, one of, that's his, his basic problem that he tries to sort out. And he, the conclusion he comes to is that it's to test the virtue of the lover. There's a way of um, seeing what his real motives are. So, although he thinks that there are um, there are there is bad relationships or there's bad eros, which is just focused on the body and just focused on the um, on lust. Um, that doesn't mean that the body and physical attributes are completely excluded from the good. It's just that the main consideration of the good is on the character. And anything else is like, uh, is fine, so long as character is the main impulse. Um, I think that's what, that's what people have got from... Um, Pausanias, in my view, there's very little evidence apart from that. <laughs> this, this, it's just what he comes to is what, what is a good reason for um, a boy to put out? What does he want out of the relationship? And it's clear from everything he says that one of the main reasons boys were thought to put out is for political advantage or for money. Um, and he says, well, obviously that's not virtuous. So what they have to do is they, they, um, they put out in order to get virtue from their, um, their pursuer. And this very specious argument, in my view, has become a, a central myth that people see this as, a, as the truth about Greek homosexuality, what everybody believed, whereas it's what one character in Plato yeah. is arguing to get himself out of a problem, acknowledging that normally that's not what happens at all. So I don't believe, no, I think that's just um, a feature of Plato's symposium. I don't think that's the truth at all. He has two shots at it, but one thing which I think is very interesting is that he um, he comes to think of same-sex eros as a kind of um, almost comparing it to its heterosexual counterpart. But instead of producing reproducing actual uh, babies, it reproduces ideas and forms, and it, mm -hmm. it comes to be something which is much more idealistic. Um, so I normally ignore that because I don't think I'm, I'm a historian of Greek social history. I'm not a Platonist. I'm not really interested in Platonic philosophy. But it's quite interesting that Platonic philosophy, a lot of the higher ideals of Platonic philosophy, a lot of the um, the sense of the invisible world, the importance of the soul, the mind-body split, um, comes out of his thinking about same-sex relationships. Um, and then, finally, in his last work in Laws, he seems to roundly condemn homosexuality. So it's very difficult to follow what Plato thought um, in Phaedrus, in Symposium, and in Laws. He has very different attitudes. Um, that's another very tricky question. All these questions are very tricky. Um, I think the way that the Greeks divide up the world of love um, semantically is different from the way that we do. And so we have tried to map on our words onto their words, and that causes all kinds of conf confusion. Um, so to give you an example, the most common word is eros, yes? And so because we have the words like erotic, um, we, we tend to think that that's about sex, whereas eros just means passionate love. So it's very driven, it's very heated, but it's not necessarily about sex. I mean, very often passionate love will be to do with sex, but it doesn't mean sex. Um, and people have often contrasted that with philia, which we translate as friendship. Mm -hmm. And therefore, 
we think of it as a completely asexual. So we think eros is sexual love, philia is non-sexual love, and that's not true at all. Philia can be used of any kind of intimacy. It can be friends, but it can also be husband and wife. Um, it can even be courtesans and their clients. They can talk about love um, in terms of philia. And um, in the aorist tense, it normally means to kiss. So it's, it's definitely not a, a quiet kind of um, <laughs> sexless version of love. Another word is agape, which the Christians took as their love. So the Christian love, agape. Um, again, that's, that can often mean something like a, um, someone doting on someone, like a father doting on children. But we also find it um, in an erotic context. So these are, it, again, it's not a word which means sexlessness. So we have to be really, really careful when we translate these words into um, English because there are lots of what you call false friends, lots of little um, uh, traps for us. Um, I think what, what does seem clear is that the way that they conceive of eros is that it's a very, very powerful, strong emotion. Um, and very often in context, it implies a distance. So it's, it's something which drives you to connect with someone. Um, so philia is about people who are intimate and close. Eros is about that, that person over there that you're obsessed with, that you, you, you kind of can't stop thinking about. And this is why I think um, people have made a big point that mutual eros is impossible. And although there are one or two cases where you can say that uh, there's an example of this, and normally that's correct, and that's because um, you can't have two people carrying a torch for each other. Mm -hmm. as, soon as, as soon as that happens, then it becomes philia, then it becomes intimate love. Philia is intimate love. The, the Erastes is the pursuer, the admirer. The Aromanos is the object of that pursuit. But because Eros doesn't mean sex, yeah. it just means passion, um, the Aromanos is not necessarily the sexually passive partner. He's the erotically passive partner. He is uh -huh. the object yeah. of love. And the Erastes um, is a kind of professional suitor. Um, one boy might have lots of Erastai, in another dialogue of Plato and comedies, we see the very beautiful youth comedies um, being followed around by a gang of Erastai. Um, so an Erastai, uh, an Erastes is someone who writes love poetry, who writes graffiti, who's pursuing someone. That's the typical Erastes, someone who's pursuing someone. Courtesans also have Erastai. Um, suitors who are pursuing them, though we normally imagine that um, in that case they get much closer to the object much faster. Well, it's difficult to say with Plato, is he being obscure? Um, to what extent is he hinting and to what extent is he being straightforward? Um, we hear that um, the Erastes um, would do all kinds of crazy things, um, following around, stalking, in other words, as well as writing poetry and um, uh, giving presents of hares very often. In, in pottery, at least, we see um, Erastai offering hares or you know things that they've caught to the um, object. Um, and the, the boy is not supposed to be responding. He's, he's supposed to be some, he's supposed to keep his purity as much as possible. And if you believe Plato, he's, he's supposed to be waiting for the, to see signs of virtue, <laughs> to see signs of virtue in his pursuer. And you don't put out for money or political power, meaning most boys were thought to put out for money or political uh -huh, power. Yeah. A rich um, sponsor. It always comes down, I know students always roll their eyes, but it always comes down to sources. It's always about yeah. how do we know, what kind of impression is given by these things. Um, and one of the reasons why we think that there's such a difference between Greeks and Romans is because the nature of the data, the nature of the texts which have survived. And so um, 
Latin literature has a very strong tradition of love poetry, heterosexual love poetry, um, which is often modelled on um, or derives from um, same-sex poetry, from Greek same-sex poetry. So Sappho, writing about women, is a very strong influence on um, Catullus and mm -hmm. other poets. So that's quite an interesting transcription, if you like, that you've got um, the, a lot of lyrical poetry from the early Greek period, which can be very, very early. Um, Sappho is writing very intensely, very personally, um, probably around 600 BCE. Uh, we know nothing about her society. We don't know what it looked like. We don't know if the we can't find any temples from that period. We don't know what kind of society it was. It has left almost no artifacts apart from these intense personal feelings of Sappho. And we know it's Sappho because she says me Sappho. You know, we know it's not a character that she's adopting. Um, so I think that's a very interesting, um, really quite extraordinary phenomenon that the, some of the earliest texts we have after Homer are these very intense, intimate, lyrical poems. And they have had a huge impact on all um, European love poetry, I would argue, including the, um, the Romans. Um, I'm not an expert on um, the morality of the end of the Republic and the early empire. Um, Famously, Ovid got into trouble for writing the way he did. To what extent are these poems reflections of reality and to what extent are they um, setting up a glamorous scenario, even something which is slightly naughty and risque, um, which doesn't really have any actual mm -hmm. um, parallel in real life? Um, was it that Augustus couldn't get the joke? He wasn't in on the irony? Or was the game being played in a, in a very double way that, okay, you don't know if I'm telling the truth, you don't know if I'm really seducing these women, um, but actually I probably am. And I'm just trying to, you know, where, where does the, the, in this game of smoke and mirrors, where does it end? Um, how in, in this society, which theoretically has such strict rules about sexual morality, how can you get away with all of this um, seducing um, women of high status, supposedly? So I think that's that's one of the the difference is the literature. Uh, there's a big difference in the we have nothing like um, Ovid or Propertius or Catullus from the Greek period. Mm -hmm. None of that. Non, no girlfriends.